Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. And today we're going to speak about Montaigne. Montagna? How do you say it? I say it Montaigne. I say Montaigne. I don't pronounce anything right. M-O-N-T-A-I-G-N-E. We're going to speak about his essay, Of the Education of Children. But just before we started uh, recording, we were talking about our pencils. <laughs> yeah, and Scott had mentioned, because I was looking for a pencil, that now that he's a grown-up, that one of the things that that means is that he can go buy his favorite kind of pencil and just get a bunch of them. I get a bunch of them. I don't get like one box just in August that lasts the year. Yeah. And you know what else you can do? And I'm not going to know the name of the brand. It's a Mitsubishi from our friends in Japan. Your pencil sharpener uh, is a Mitsubishi. Yeah. Although made in some other country, sadly. But you can look up. I recommend you do this. Find yourself a good quality pencil sharpener, not that little 99 cent thing that you got from Walgreens. Get yourself a good pencil sharpener and a box of high quality pencils and your reading experience will be much better. And you know what makes it a high quality pencil, in my opinion, is one thing that's important. The lead needs to be centered. Oh, yes. And the wood needs to be wood. I don't like that weird plasticky wood colored stuff yeah it has to be centered uh, our friend everett who helps us with leather goods at online great books and stuff he, mm -hmm. he hipped me to the kum pencil sharpener made in germany the as2 it's just a little handheld pencil sharpener it's got two two different blades in it two different holes with a different blade in each one and one of them just cuts the wood away and then the other one, you can just sharpen the lead because you'll find a lot of times you can just put it in there and just hit that lead and just dress it up and you don't, it saves your pencil, man. Yeah. The Mitsubishi KH20 also recommended by our friends on the Slack channel. And it's a, it's a pretty good pencil. You can do a long tip or a short tip. If you want a, a more blunt tip for bolder strokes, you press the button, you click it in, you do it that way. And if you want the long, which is what I prefer, the long, narrow pointy, dangerous mm. tip, you press it the other way. Do you have any pencil lead in your hands or your arm or anything from when you were a kid? <laughs> Not anymore. I think we got rid of it all. Uh, now, we used to have pencil battles in the... Uh, yeah. My brother and I went to the public school for remedial history. We didn't need it because we were in the band. We had to fit an elective in. So we went to the public school for a history class in the summer and we blew the curve for all the public school kids. And we would just sit in the back and have epic pencil battles. Hmm. We'd stab each other because we were kids. But this ain't Montaigne. <laughs> but before we go any further, hey guys, uh, go listen to go subscribe to our other, our sister show, brother show, our other show. Music and Ideas, we do that show, Carl and I, with Michelle Hawkins. And iTunes, that thing's kind of hard to find on iTunes, but we're going to build that audience and get iTunes attention, and then when we get their attention, they will help other people find us. So go there and subscribe to that if you like this show and or that one. Send a recommendation for this thing to uh, one of your friends. That is a big help to us. We're doing the same thing with music that we're trying to do with books. We're trying to... And what I think we're trying to do with books is show you good stuff for you to go and enjoy. And so Scott and I chew on this, on these things. Well, we're doing the same thing with music. Only we have somebody who knows more music than we do. Yeah. She's, and, she's super smart and, uh, couldn't do that thing without her. So go subscribe to that show. And today we're going to talk about this, uh, Montaigne's on the, of the education of children. I got one review I'm going to read and then we'll go talk. Uh, Evan, we left a review on iTunes of this show. Thank you, Evan. It says, I went to Catholic seminary for only two years. There I was exposed to philosophy, great literature, and men who wanted to discuss these works outside of class under the night sky, chewing Copenhagen and drinking a cheap bottle of wine is the most influential time of my life so far. I've missed those conversations. This podcast takes me back and helps me to be born in wonder. That is an awfully sweet little uh, review. Thank you for putting that in there, man. 
Wonderful. Yeah, I hope we do that for you, listener. And if we do, send this thing over to your buddy who needs a little bit of it. Buddies are girls sometimes, you know that? No. You don't think so? <laughs> does, does Melissa not have buddies? I don't know. They have a mom's group. Yeah, those are her buddies. I don't think they are. I think buddies are a different thing. You mean they don't like make fun of each other and play grab ass? Right. You know, they don't meet each other and say, you look terrible. Yeah. <laughs> you look like a bucket of <laughs> excrement without the bucket. I didn't know they stacked it that high. <laughs> yeah. I think there's probably a difference. I got my copy, which I was showing Scott on the video. I just got it in today. I had to read it on the internet, but I wanted to have my own copy of the Essays of Montaigne, which it comes in three volumes. Uh, I think two of them are the essays, and one is just a handbook of citations and things. And on the inside cover, I can't quite read the name. It says, to so-and-so, with all our love, Al and Shirley. So at some point, probably 100 years ago, yeah, 1919 is when this, oh, no, this one's from 46. So it's not 100 years ago. But somebody thought that a young man needed to have a copy of the essays of Montaigne. And I think that's probably still true. You know, Adler, I think this is right. I say stuff like this and I'm probably wrong sometimes, but I think this is right. Mortimer Adler said that Plutarch's Lives of Famous Greeks and and Romans and the Essays of Montaigne were essentially his Desert Island books. Like if you could only take two, those are the ones. Yeah, and I'm somewhat new to it. So uh, this is going to be a pleasure. I'm going to keep them right by my desk and uh, poke through these. They're conversational. At least I thought so. He's the original blogger. Yeah, a bunch of hot takes. Yeah. I think he contradicts himself in the middle of this thing on poetry. But, you know, who cares, right? Uh, You're not going to catch him out. There's a lot of, if you've read Emerson and Thoreau, there's a lot of Montaigne and Emerson and Thoreau, I think. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think that this essay on the education of children is a destructive and dangerous book that should not be let out into the wild. Mm. Yeah. That, That contradiction thing. I've got this other little blog that I write. In, um, at scotthambrick.com. That's where I say all the crazy stuff I want to say. <laughs> and uh, a guy commented on there. He's a friend. Uh, well, actually, he's the host of the Combat and Classics podcast, which is a good show. He said, well, this thing here you said contradicts your sort of free market principles that you espoused earlier. And I said, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> right. I don't have to be 100% consistent from top to bottom. I'd like to be, but... Yeah, it's a well. The problem with consistency is it can be a substitute for thinking. Okay, you're working your way through the thoughts, whatever you have uh, on that day, and whatever you're writing, and perhaps you're contradicting something that you said last week or 20 years ago. Oh, I hope so. Well, what's going to rule you? Is it going to be what you think right now that's appropriate for the particular thing you're writing on or are you going to say nope i can't really think that because i thought something else five years ago oh i think you misunderstood i contradicted myself in an 1800 word essay (laughs) (laughs) still don't care like i think some it it was a problem of scale it was a problem of scale like i think some i think the free market stuff will hold at some scales and not at others so i'm not free market from top to bottom so you're not pure i'm not pure when it comes to the free market, I'm filthy. <laughs> Dirty ec- economics. Yeah. But back to Montaigne. Yeah, I think he did contradicts himself. But he's so much fun. He's so much fun, and he's so darn smart. This little essay is written to, for the benefit of a lady, Madame Diane de Foix, I guess, Countess of Gerson. I don't know. These are all French words. I'm from Oklahoma. I don't know. She's pregnant, and he writes this essay for her, writes this letter to her about educating children as she's getting ready, I guess, to have her first child. He talks about how he thinks education should be done, and he talks a lot about his own education, which was pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. I think it's just wonderful. And right there in the very first page that he says he in his childhood had obtained the outer covering of learning, and he says, has retained of it merely a general and shapeless impression a little of everything and nothing thoroughly after the French fashion. We're always talking about after the French fashion on this show somehow. That tickled me right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. That's what there's that line from, you know, Titanic. What? 
draw me like one of your French girls, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> Is that one of the movies that you think are awful? I've never seen it. You never seen Titanic? Mm -mm. You're probably better for it. How long yeah, is it? It's so like the, long, the French it? fashion. Even back in 1580, whenever he wrote this, there was the French fashion. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. So I thought it's a, a dangerous book, one that you cannot let you know impressionable people read because he is not a fan of compulsion in education. In really anything. Yeah. It, but especially, well, in this essay, for education. Yeah. Yeah, he says there's nothing that will squash curiosity and a love of learning and a love of the world more than compulsion and force. By golly, I think he's right. So if you go to school and you they ring the bell and you go to your next class and they ring the bell and you go to your next class, you get graded on whether you agree with what's in the textbook. Well, no, you don't get nobody cares whether you agree. They care whether you reproduce what's in the textbook. Mm. The, this wouldn't be much of an education. This is not how Montaigne would do it. What he advocates for is so different. It can't even be done in a modern classroom. Right. So why? tell me why. Why can't it be done in a modern classroom? Well, first of all, he says it needs to be one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. So you have to hire a tutor. So I, I was thinking about that. Why can't you teach 30 people? Because I've done this in my past. <laughs> in my misspent youth, I have attempted to teach 30 people. Do you think, uh, having done that, do you think it can be done? I mean, having tried mm. that, can it be done? No. <laughs> no, no, you, you'll teach a, a few of them, mm -hmm. but most of them are there to, to punch the clock, you know, get the time in. Have they read the thing that you're going to talk about? Are they following the conversation? Are they partaking in the conversation? It, rote memorization if I have a difference with Montaigne, it's probably on that. He doesn't think much of that. Yeah. And I think there's a purpose for it. I, I probably agree more with, with Dorothy Sayers on that. There's a time when you have to just learn a lot of content. Yeah. But it's not education if you're not making it your own. Education, if you even think about the word, education is leading out in Latin. Like ex, like exit, and then duco, like il duce, to, to lead. So it's you're leading out, you're drawing out of the student. How do you do that in a group of 30? So my, my daughter said something funny to me just as I was about to come down. All my children are odd. Mission accomplished. But she said, Daddy, I've noticed something about utopian literature. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> like, what did Sarah say? Well, she noticed that they were generally set on islands. Mm. And she gave me some examples. This is while we were on our break from our podcast. And then she said, it, it's because she gave me a conclusion. It's because if you're not on an island, the utopia would become corrupted by outside influence. Mm. Original thought from her, not something I put into her. Well, how did it get there? Well, we talk about this stuff all the time. You know, uh, last night she was taught, she's doing a paper and I was quizzing her on moral issues and the things she was writing about. And I wasn't necessarily think, saying things I agreed with, but I was challenging her and saying, well, what about this? What about this? Well, what do you think here? Not that I'm an ideal educator. Uh, mostly I just like to talk about these things. But she was taking what she was learning and thinking through it. Not can you repeat it to me? Mm -hmm. but rather what are the consequences of this you know is it yours if you can't speak intelligently about it it's not really yours and i don't know how you do that with a classroom of 30 yeah he says that you need to hire a tutor and then he pretty much let me make some generalization here he pretty much says that that tutor needs to adopt the methods of Socrates. The student should do most of the talking and that the tutor will be doing a sort of a drawing out. Yeah, we have different translations, so I'm going to ask Scott for page numbers so that I can... Yeah, on page, I had, on, on page 200, it says that most, most school teachers are always bawling into our ears as if pouring into a tunnel and our business is simply to repeat what they tell us. But I would have him amend this state of things 
and that from the outset, according to the ability of the mind he has to deal with, he's talking about the tutor. So according to the ability of the mind, the tutor has to deal with, he should begin to exercise it, making it examine things, choose among them and distinguish them by, by itself, sometimes breaking out the path for it, sometimes letting it break it out. I would not have him alone and think and speak. I would have him listen while his pupil has him take his turn at speaking. Socrates and after him are so, I don't know, first made their pupils talk and then talked to them. The authority of those who teach is very often a hindrance to those who wish to learn. Yeah. Oh, I can't remember where I read it. Describing a, oh, it's in a novel I read that is describing one of the characters that she was taking notes in the classroom and oh no it was in the Mishima mm. that she would even record the coughs of the instructor i saw that the lighthouse lady's girl she was that kind of student and i remember the first time that that i taught in a traditional classroom i was a grad student and i think i was i was teaching the intro philosophy class i think and it was the first day it was a very weird experience i started talking and pencils started moving. <laughs> That's awful. Yeah, I mean, who the heck am I, right? I love this line. Uh, it's a quote from, I guess, Arcus Silas. I'd have to chase down the reference. The authority of those who teach is very often a hindrance to those who wish to learn. The authority. Uh, you're going to go sit at the feet of the master and swallow what the master says to you. Yep. That's not education. You know, I get a bunch of heat from our own, uh, our own members at online great books, uh, because we, we tell them to avoid reading the introduction to these works and sec other secondary sources. And, and I think it's because the authority that lies in those things, in those secondary sources and in those uh, introductions often poisons the well and leads the reader to not, think about it and to synthesize and create with their own mind, but to regurgitate. I'll go so far as to say that if you read a secondary source before you read one of these great books, uh, you've wasted it and you'll never be able to read it. Mm -hmm. you, you might, you might take in all the words, but you personally will never be able to develop your own reading of that book. Yeah. Authority is a, it's a dangerous thing. And people that have that authority, should need to be very careful with it. Wouldn't you love to be able to read the Iliad knowing nothing about Greek gods? Mm. Oh my, it would be awe-inspiring. What? Zeus, what? Yeah. I remember at Online Great Books, I think, uh, Ben Hahn, I'll name him. He posted a picture of our Aristotle that we ship out the Nicomachean ethics on his reading stand. And he said, so we begin. And I just got so excited for him because I can't read it a first time ever again, you know? Right. What a thing to go do that for the first time. Yeah. And if you come to it, I have a whole bunch of this stuff. I have like little pocket guides to Aristotle. If you start with that, you're ruined. You're ruined. And it might even be Right. It might even be correct. I think the one that I have is, is pretty decent. I don't think I have any particular objections to what it comes up with. But what's the goal of reading? Is the goal of reading memorization of what the person said, or is it thinking? You know, I don't care. Like, when I, I'm going to go up and chat about utopias with my eldest daughter mm -hmm. after this because she brought it up. And I, I tell her this a, a few times. I'll make a joke of it. You know, I'll say, you don't have to agree with me unless you want to be right. Right. You know, <laughs> But I don't really care at this point. I care that she's doing the thinking. Mm -hmm. The m important thing is not her regurgitation. It's her digestion. Something that happens within her. That's what's important. Not whether she matches what somebody else says in the scholarly literature. Yeah, we even have this in our language. Somebody will say, well, what's, you know, uh, this coronavirus thing's going around, you know, what's your reading in this thing? That word can mean, you know, to interpret. And uh, for Montaigne, it's very, it's very important to him that the student be interpreting. He says, he says there, he wants them to, uh, where is it? He should examine things, choose among them, distinguish them. 
You know, he wants people to be choosing, judging, thinking. Yep. And and you can't do that when you're being told. You have to do it. You might get corrected, right? Your 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 good tutor that your parents hired under Montaigne's model might say, "Well, young man, uh, young woman, what about this other thing?" You might get corrected, but I think you have to choose. You have to interpret. You have to decide I, first. I want to say something a little bit different there. I don't know that you'd be. It's not that you're corrected. Um, I posted a quote from this on Instagram. I'm not going to be able to find it at the moment. Where Montaigne says something about you should submit to the judgments of your own reason, mm. and that that's a good mark when, at the end of a heated argument, you you actually submit yourself to your reason. Okay, so it's not that the tutor is going to correct you and say, "Well, actually, you're wrong about the War of 1812," or or whatever you're talking about. Right. You're going to correct yourself. All the tutor will say is, well, what about this? Right. Have you considered this? And then you think through it and say, well, gosh, no, I hadn't. And then and then maybe you change your mind and maybe you don't. But you change your mind. And the mind is what's central to this project of education, not your conformity with whatever the teacher wants you to to say. That I'm just allergic to that. He says there at kind of the bottom of 201 and then then. Then right at the top of 202 here in our Charles Ives translation we're reading, he says, let him make him sift everything and lodge nothing in his brain on authority merely and on trust. Let not Aristotle's principles be his principles any more than those of the Stoics or Epicureans. Epicureans, let this diversity of opinions be put before him. He will choose if he can. If not, he will remain in doubt. And then he says later, for if he embraces the opinions of Xenophon and of Plato by his own judgment, they will no longer be their opinions. They will be his. Once you judge those things, you don't do what you're told. You're not given a study guide, the Sparks notes. But once you judge them and you decide that you agree, they're not their ideas anymore. They're yours, or at least also yours. I love that. That whole paragraph is... Is a is a good one. No, none but a fool is sure and determined. Mm. The fools are very sure that they're right. If you have a little bit of, you know, you're making the best judgment based on what you've come up with. But if you're rock solid, you might be a fool. So am I being foolish about the Beatles when I say I hate them? <laughs> if there's nothing good about them. <laughs> I bet there's something good about them. We might have to unpack that. that. that, We were talking about the Beatles earlier on the music I think the best thing about them is half of them are gone. (laughs) Scott's not a fan of the Beatles. No. Beatles. Uh, And he's pretty sure about it. Well, (laughs) there's some neat things in there. Could could be. Could be. The harmonies in Magical Mystery Tour. I really like the beginning of that. But maybe we'll do that on another podcast. Hmm. I really like right here um, in the middle of that paragraph on 202, every man may lay claim to truth and reason. They are no more his property who first uttered them than his who uttered them later. Every man may lay claim to truth and reason. God, that reads like Thoreau. It does, doesn't it? If there is a common human reason, you know, that we don't need to worry about so much about intersectionality and, and getting various viewpoints because every single human being is capable of thinking and is capable of getting at whatever truth is there. Yeah, rationality so I, and reason is a tool available to everyone, and it never gets dull, and it costs nothing. It's the great equalizer. Right. And so, but if there is such a thing, you know, so Montaigne is a rationalist, I guess. I mean, there is such a thing as reason, uh, and the purpose of the education is to awaken that in the child not to make him think a certain thing i want to take exception exception with myself Hmm. can you make somebody think a thing no you can make them tell you they think something you know your your thoughts are is are really are, are perhaps this may not this may not be true but i'll say it anyway they may be the only thing that you actually have that can't be taken, that are your own. That, that might be it. Um, everything else might be on loan. Yeah. Right at the very beginning, we kind of went into the tutor thing when you were talking about the classes of 30 kids and, and talked about he says this should be done one-on-one in this Socratic way. 
uh, earlier on, on maybe the first two or three pages of your edition that you're reading, Reader, on page 195 for us, he talks about reading hard books. He talks about reading hard books right at the bottom. He says, it happened the other day that I came upon such a passage. He's talking about, I think it was Epicurus. I had dragged languidly along through French words, so bloodless, so fleshless, and so void of substance of sense that they were really only French words. At the end of a long and wearisome road, I came upon a lofty, ornate fragment rising to the clouds. Had I found the slope gradual and the ascent a little prolonged, the thing would have been pardonable, but it was a steep so sheer and abrupt that from the first six words I knew that I escaped into heaven. There I discerned the pit from which I had come, so far below and so deep, that I have never since had the courage to go down into it. If I should stuff out one of my discourses with with these rich spoils, it would throw too much light on the stupidity of others. Man, that's what it's right like to read these hard books. I mean, he just he just nailed it. I just you know, I've I've griped on the last four podcasts, I think, about struggling through metaphysics. And you just read these words, you're like, yeah, I know all the words the guy's using them, but the order you put them in is pretty tough, you know, and it's just a mess. And then he'll put a bow on it and hand it to you. It's just like he said, it's like he escaped into heaven, you know, this guy just shows you this special little thing. My grandmother would say it was strugglesome to get there. And you never want to go back to the strugglesome part, but that's what it's right to read these books. There's a, a joy a real joy to these moments of insight that you come across when you make the connection Yep. and you say, Oh, I get it. Or, or you start, you know, Oh, that's what the French fashion is. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I do want to know what that is. <laughs> I think it's probably illegal in Tulsa. Mm-hmm. We still have blasphemy laws here. You'd have to go down to Texas for that. But, uh, <laughs> These moments of insight, this is what we're after. And once you start getting it, uh, then you want more of it. You want more of it. And you're you're not going to be content with just swimming around in the pit, like he says. You're, yeah. you're going to want to stuff, dwell on the heights, right? And, and stuff out one of my discourses with these rich spoils. I, I said a while ago that it reads like Thoreau. Wait a minute. Thoreau reads like this guy. Right. Yeah, he, he wants to, he has all of his essays to have those little gifts in them. Uh, on the next page, he says, uh, when he's, he's talking about writing, like th- this book's book is a book of essays. It's the essays of Miguel de Montaigne. They're his own personal thoughts. And no, I don't think anybody has really, had really written anything like this before him. And if they did, it didn't survive. Aurelius wrote his meditations, but they're these sort of aphorisms. There's no long form self-reflective work in there like this. So uh, he, he's very, he's keenly aware that what he's doing is different. And he says, uh, of writing down the idol, he says, okay, here it is. I mean to say that however this may be and whatever worth these idle, idle thoughts of mine, I have not planned to conceal them any more than a portrait of myself, bald and turning gray, which the painter had drawn, not a perfect face, but mine. He just wants to record the contents of his own mind and his own thoughts. He's like documenting his consciousness here. Now, why is this interesting? I think it is one of the first and best depictions of the Western concept of self. How about that? Well, that's a good one. Well, he's not the first, I don't think. Uh, I think... In Cicero's letters, you get some of this. I think in Augustine's Confessions, you get a whole okay, lot of it. Okay, Confessions, you do. You're right. I'll, I'll buy that. It's real good. And I'm thinking, why? But what I meant by the question was, why do I... I wrote two of these essays getting ready for this podcast. Why did I find them so delightful? Just following along this man, his thoughts, wherever they went. It elevates your own. Hmm. All he's writing about is the contents of his own mind. This is what I think about this. And inviting you to think along with him. Does the fact that he does this give you some legitimacy when you do it? I mean, is he co-signing on your own project here, or is that why? Yeah, well, I don't I do not do that much writing, and it's usually not so personal, but... Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of what we do in a podcast or when you listen to a podcast. I listen to a few. 
I like thinking along with the people who are thinking out loud. Yeah. I like the, pa- the, the passage there where he says, I have not planned to conceal them, being my thoughts, any more than a portrait of myself bald and turning gray in which the painter had drawn not a perfect face but mine. I mean, that, that's what we have to do on this show. I think if it's going to be any good, we have to share our thoughts, good, bad, and different, and just own them as your own, and they may be wrong. They may be ill-informed. They may be hasty, but we have to be willing to, I hate this word, be authentic. <laughs> Uh, well, that's usually an empty word, but I was just thinking that, that we're recording a whole bunch of our thoughts and they might be good and they might be bad, but they're awfully much thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dear listener can judge the quality, I guess. Yeah, but I, we're thinking out loud for you. And, you know, that's what I like to listen to mm-hmm. on other podcasts that I listen to. I, I, I want to, you know, you on that Barbo Logic one and Brett and the other Brett. This is my brother Listen. Carl and my brother Brett, my other brother Brett. <laughs> I do the Instagram lives from time to time where I talk conspiracy theories and other weirdness. And people will come on there who are podcast listeners and, you know, whatever, follow me. Maybe they're barbell people. Maybe they're book people. I got a weird group of people. <laughs> and they often say, you know, how, how, how do you do that? People ask me that all the time. How do you do that? You just get on there and you just say this stuff. I'm probably a little bit broken, you know, because I can go on there and say say whatever it is I feel like I need to say or I believe that I need to say, and it sometimes gets me in trouble. Um, but do it, we must. Even if the painting is a of a gray, graying, balding man, it's but our painting. Uh, I don't think I have any choice but to do it. Let me talk about me for a while, Carl. I think one of the, enough about me. Yeah, I think one of the reasons that that I can do this, if I if I'm any good at it, I don't know, but is because I just wasn't schooled. I was just feral in terms of school. You know, it was so, one of the the best thing about Catoosa Public Schools is how bad it was. It, it, like it, it was so bad that it had no legitimacy or authority in my mind whatsoever, and I felt free to do whatever I wanted to do. I, I didn't buy into it for an instant. I never made a good grade. I barely graduated. I had to like bribe a teacher to graduate. Have I told you that story? Uh, about bribery? No, I did not know. Do tell. When I was a senior, I took, what was it? Physiology, I think. And I was failing that. And uh, I had some okay passing grades in some other classes. But to graduate, I had to get a D in physiology. And I went to the teacher and I said, hey, listen, I got I to gotta get, get out of here. And I know you want me out of here, so we need to make a deal. And he's like, well, you can do this extra credit. And I said, what if I cut, split, deliver, and stack two ricks of hardwood firewood to your house? Would that get it there? (laughs) And he said, yeah, that would be fine. (laughs) So It's all been a lie. (laughs) So I got a a diploma. Built on hardwood. Firewood. That's right. (laughs) Well, I was thinking the... the there are some contradictions in me. Uh, that's for sure. I have been to lots and lots of school, but I also like one of the formative songs of my youth is another brick in the wall. Part two. That was my class song. (laughs) It was. Yeah. We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control, no dark sarcasm in the classroom. Hey, teacher, leave those kids alone. And yet I went back to school. But in in grade school, I was bored most of the time. We were some bright spots, but I wanted to know stuff. Yeah. And school seemed to be the place that you went to know stuff. I guess my opinion on it changed. Having been inside higher education and seeing it's not necessarily the place where you go to know stuff. Mm-hmm. It's the place where you go. It's just a higher... I, I have some people that I that I know that still work in it but it, it's where you go for a higher degree of conformity yeah and uh, it can be good doggone it you guys it can be good but it's tough but it, you know I, I I would think um, so in the middle ages they used to defenestrate people <laughs> throw them out a window yeah yeah if the professor said something they didn't like they'd throw them out of the window that's such and, a funny word you know I always love that word to finish straight, to throw out of the window. Yes. 
Yeah, you're going to find uses for this in your casual conversation now. Uh, <laughs> and I wished that the classrooms were places that were that lively. <laughs> right. Where people would care enough that they might threaten to. Can you? I, I would have loved to be like the professor walking in there and having to have my dukes up. You know, and say, don't you defenestrate me. We're going to talk today and it's going to be feisty and you're going to get mad. But if you defenestrate me, I'm going to fight back and defenestrate you. <laughs> Somebody's going out the window and ain't me. <laughs> but so many times in, in the classroom, it was just dull. Yeah. I'm just here because I need the diploma. I'm not really thinking thoughts. I'm not really working through any of this. Just give me my diploma here. Here's your firewood. Give me my diploma. Let me out of here. And that's not what it should be. That's not what education should be. Education should be exciting. If it's not exciting, you're probably not being educated. How's mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I think so. Exciting uh, is stimulating. <sighs> Montaigne wants to take these, uh, wants to separate these kids from their parents, not in a Plato kind of way, but he does. They're on 204, Carl. I'll read this chunk. He says, it is an opinion accepted by everyone that it is not well to bring up a child in the lap of his parents. Their natural affection softens and relaxes them too much, even the wisest. They are capable neither of punishing his defaults nor of allowing him to be nurtured roughly, as he should be, and at haphazard. They could not endure his returning sweating and dusty from his exercisings, taking hot or cold drinks, or to see him on a rest of horse or facing a skillful fencer, foil in hand, or his first arquebus. There is no escape. He who would make of him a man of worth must doubtless not spare him in those early years and must often run counter to the rules of medicine. There's a few things there. So I, I just wrote in my notes on my brand new used edition of Montaigne. Says you, I want it hard on my kids. Yeah. I'm, maybe I'm not hard enough. I mean, I don't want to be mean or cruel, but... Why don't you take mine and I'll take yours? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have just enough separation, you know. I don't want any broken bones, but, you know. <laughs> right. So, right. So, it, your kid comes in crying because something's hard. What's your reaction? Oh, I guess you don't need to do that. Or, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, sure is. Your mom and I did it once. Go ahead. Get on it. Yeah, it, it just... Things are difficult sometimes. You have to do hard things. And so there might be, there may be many parents who are indulgent like that. I, I know for a fact there are. Yeah. I don't we, want their the babies whole... to have any trouble at all in the world, but not me. Yeah. We you have know? the whole. I want my uh, kids to have a lot of good trouble. What helicopter um, parent phenomenon we people talk about now, you know? Yeah. And this is in the context of uh, a little bit later on that page of. The kid needs to do hard stuff, says Montaigne, and I, I really like that. It's, let him live under the open sky and amid dangers. It is not enough to strengthen his mind. We must strengthen his muscles, too. The mind is too hard-pressed if it be not supported and has too much to do to discharge alone two functions. you got to do hard stuff. Mm -hmm. you got to do hard physical stuff. Carl and I also read on the affection of fathers for their children, uh, we'll, we'll not talk about that on this one, probably, but he doesn't like the rod and the paddle. He's a peaceful parenting guy. He wants a rational conversation. He wants persuasion. He doesn't like coercion. And he says nothing good was gotten through coercion ever anyway. You know, he's not going to force these kids to do anything. And later on, he talks about how uh, coercion ruins curiosity in an education anyway. He wants to let reality dole out the punishments. You know, he, he he says he wants them to live under the open sky and amid dangers. The best way to learn how to handle a pocket knife safely is to cut yourself. <laughs> Maybe our favorite way would to re be receive a bunch of safety instruction and then never do it. But the truth of it is, the <laughs> real truth is, the way you figure out how to do that is you cut yourself. Yeah. And, you know, John Sr., he says that these kids should be exposed to these dangers through rock climbing, bucking horses, whatever, boxing. And then they should be around people of the opposite sex because he says bones will knit and souls can be recovered. I really like that. 
the parents don't have to meet out the punishments if they place the kids firmly in the middle of reality and let reality weigh on them. Yeah, I, I think, heck, I think getting your deadlift to 405 it's worth is a, a lot. good school of reality. Mm -hmm. It's a good number for an adult male is 405. Um, you're pretty strong then. And it's going to take you a little work to get there. And you're going to want to cry. Well, maybe. Yep. Well, I do. Deb is hard for me. But it's worth it. And it's a case of suppressing your inclinations to get something good. It's the gum jabbar, man. Right. You have right. to be a human because it's too, it's, it's too heavy. Right. You can't just get hold of it and push and stand up. You have to use all of your rationality to push and stand up under that. You know, people that haven't done that probably don't understand what we're seeing there because it just seems all bone and sinew to get it done, but it's not. It's too heavy. Your, your, the fir your first sensation of a barbell with 405 on it is that it's glued to the floor and it's an impossibility. But your coach told you you could do it. You did 395. Mm -hmm. you, you know, and, and you have to trust and you have to know and you have to will your muscles to lock your joints out to get it to happen. Yeah. So this is part of uh, being human. Yep is that we have rationality that allows us to examine these things. And it's not all instinct. Uh, in that, on the, the affection of fathers, he, he talks about how in the animal world is just natural. And for us, it's not. These things are chosen. You have to do them. Well, the practice of, of doing this sort of physical activity that he talks about, and, and I'm translating into getting your deadlift up, is you learn, I think it's actually an exercise of rationality. It's not physical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's physical sort of, but it's an exercise of mind over matter. You have to think yourself to the 405 by, by saying, well, it's Wednesday, it's deadlift day. I'm going to go warm up my deadlift and do my work. That's your mind. Your body wants to not do it if it had a choice. Can confirm. Yeah. So uh, it is a mental exercise and it develops your mind. And the reason a student needs to do this is like he was saying about uh, reading the books. Sometimes the book sticks on the floor, metaphorically, like metaphysics, Aristotle's metaphysics, which has all kinds of insights in it, but they're not delivered to you like candy. They're delivered to you like that four or five deadlift. And if you're not used to working on it, you're not going to get it. The mind is too hard pressed if it be not supported. Fantastic. I'm going to print that on a business card. Just hand that out. He also, I wrote here in the margin, uh, did Herbert read this? Frank Herbert. We just did Dune, you know, and he talks about the fencing, having these tutors and the education being taken out of the hands of the parents. I, I kind of bristle at that at first, but you know, maybe he ain't wrong. Probably don't want a state employee that's just got two more years before they can get their pension and is just phoning it in. The end. But if you've got a if you've got a tutor that cares about the a trusted tutor that cares about the, the child. You're what are the qualities the tutor needs to have? That he has to be of good character, you know, full of virtues. Uh you you have to find the right tutor. And then it's going to be good. This is not, you know, the guy serving time in the public school. It's probably going to be part of your household, you know, a trusted retainer. That might be someone you could trust the education of your children to. Yeah. But being one of the 30, that's liable for trouble. Uh, because, you know, what's in it for them? You know, the, the tutor who's part of your household, what's in it is, you know, it's the good of the whole. That's interesting. What's in it for the individual tutor, the Montanian tutor? So you get hired by the Duke of Ellington. Of Ruthenia. <laughs> the Duke of Ruthenia to, to tutor the child of the household. It's to your benefit to have the household be well-managed 
and be a place of joy and light and learning, right? Because you live there. Mm. And you're partaking of whatever good you can make come of it. Whereas if you are paid by somebody else and you have a bunch of kids come through your room, which is not to say there aren't people who are motivated, but you know, nobody loves your kids like you do. And maybe the tutor who becomes part of your household might love your kids like you do. Does that make sense? Or maybe a little bit less so that they're able to re reprimand. Mm -hmm. So the problem with that Montaigne talks about with parents doing this is you love your little darlings too much. So you need somebody who loves them a little bit less, but you need somebody who's invested. Yeah, I don't know that that tutor, that this uh, Montaigne style tutor is going to come to love the kids, uh, even anything like the parents at all. But if it's this person of character, and, and Montaigne doesn't say this, and they have a love of truth, then the ability to pursue truth and discern truth will be inculcated in that kid. Talking about what you want from your tutor. So let's see. One, in fact, who is more anxious to become an accomplished man than a scholar, I would wish great care to be taken in the selection of a guide with a well-formed rather than well-filled intellect, which is a nice distinction. One should look for a man who has both, but should put good morals and understanding before book learning and should require him to fulfill his functions in a new way. Uh, this is right before the bit about bawling into the child's ears. You don't want somebody who just knows a lot. You want somebody whose mind is a certain sort of mind. You, know, you want somebody who's going to ask your kid a lot of questions and test him. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you're, you're bringing up the example of Dune is, is pretty good. In the beginning of that book, Paul is always being tested by his tutors yep. who are members of the, of the household. That brings up some problems. Okay. What are the problems? We can't afford no tutors. I know. We don't have a, a household in the feudal French tradition. You know, Montaigne's name wasn't actually Montaigne. That's the name of the house and the region he's from. You know, he's Miguel from there. That's what his name is. Yeah. He's got some money. Yeah. You know, how, how do, how do uh, regular 21st century folk do anything like this? So how is it practical? You know, maybe maybe we just need to take the lesser good and just send our kids to the compulsory school. I don't know. you got to find a way to do it. You know what I think is look around your, your group, mm -hmm. your people. How are you going to figure out how to do it? Just, look, just because the good is hard doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Okay? If this is the way to have a properly educated human, if we're going to talk about Dune, a real human, somebody who can actually think, well, then that's a good worth doing. And you have to do whatever you need to do to do it. And if you can't do it yourself, all right, so maybe your group of people gets together and hires somebody. Hmm. You mean like a homeschool co-op? Maybe. Hmm. <laughs> People do this sort of thing uh, where you have somebody that's good at it and excited about it that that is able to do it. But keeping it closely tied to the goal, which is to get a child who can actually think. And I say that actually think. You know, there's a lot of people that don't actually think a whole lot. You're not supposed to say that, Carl. Well, a lot of people just react and don't go too much beyond the, the surface appearance of things. This has always been the case. This is the people in the cave back in Republic who sit and look at the shadows on the wall. And I, I don't want my kids to be those sorts of people yeah. because I think it's better to turn around and climb up out of the cave. And in order to do that, you have to think through stuff. And thinking requires dialectic and dialectic requires conversation and testing. And do you really know this? And what are the consequences of this? And it might require action. You want to learn business? Do you go to business school or do you start a business? You go up the garret at once. He says uh, that this student is to 
be taught not to enter into discussion or disputation except with a champion worthy of his steel. And even then, not to employ all the methods that may be of service to him, but only those that will be most effective. And then, like you said earlier, let him be taught above all to surrender and lay down his arms to the truth. Just as soon as he discovers it, whether it be born in the hands of his opponent or in himself on second thought. Yeah, give me the page for that. 206. He is not to be put in a high place of instruction to repeat a prescribed lesson. He is pledged to no cause save by the fact that he approves it nor is to belong to the confraternity in which freedom to repent and reconsider is sold for ready money, nor is he obliged by any necessity to defend all that is prescribed and enjoined. It's a dangerous book. Boy, if his tutor be of my mind, he will train his will to be a most loyal and devoted and fearless servant of his prince, but he will blow cold upon the desires to attach himself to the prince otherwise than by public service. Hmm. He's got to have that prince be a good leader. Is he trying to make a philosopher king? I think he's just trying to make decent people. Yeah, I think so. There's not much in this particular essay of, of grand political plans. Yeah. You know, he's not trying to make a king. He's trying to make this mother's child better. You know, this, madam, this is how I think we ought to educate children. You ask me, so here's my answer. So it's directed towards this individual child of his friend. I presume she's a friend that he will be the sort that lives according to reason that thinks things that gives allegiance to things only because he thinks they're right. Montaigne says that this student that the, well, first of all, he says to this lady, you're going to have a, uh, a child. And I know that you're so good and virtuous that it'll be a son. <laughs> so, so when he talks about this unborn child from here, there on, it's a, it's a boy in there. He says, that, that this boy, he must prove the range of every man, a herdsman, a mason, a wayfarer. He must put them all under contribution and borrow from each according to his wares, for everything is of some use in a household. Even the folly and weakness of other men will be instructive to him. Learn from them all, the shepherd, the mason, the wayfarer. Learn from them all, for good and for bad. Spectacular. We've heard that, right? Mm-hmm. If you learn from your own mistakes, that's great. If you learn from other people's mistakes, even better. Uh, well, I was imagining Montaigne going down to the local bar and sitting with the plumbers and the the non-literary folk. Yeah. The people that don't have the time like he does to read Plutarch. And talking to them. I don't know if he actually did this, but that seems to be what he's yeah, talking so. about here. Everybody's a source, you know, but we've talked about this before. I love when you say, you know, that all those Katusa sayings, there's a whole lot of, he's covering his eyes. And, no, there's a lot of wisdom in what everybody says. Aristotle does this too. We have to look at what everybody says. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not a hundred percent right, but you know, people seem to think that, that happiness is honor. Well, Maybe they're not 100% right, but they're thinking this for a reason and we can learn from it, that everything is a potential source for you. A little bit further, I like, let his imagination be moved by a decent curiosity to inquire into everything. <laughs> yeah. I think everything's interesting. We were, we were talking to Michelle earlier about whether some things are better than others. Is there goodness in the world? Are things just... Because they exist, are they good? I think they are, which means they're all interesting. The only things that wouldn't be interesting would be bad will, evil, I suppose, is boring. But uh, I was talking about plumbing. Plumbing would be interesting. How do they yeah, get the crap out of your house and then make it not poison your community? That's interesting to me. Pretty my important. dad used to work in that. He Apparently, some of the dates that my father took my mother on were to the sewage treatment plant. Hmm. No, no one said he wasn't a romantic. <laughs> he might listen to this someday. He is an online great books member. On 214, at the bottom paragraph there, Carl, he says, it's a remarkable fact that things have come to such a pass in our time that philosophy is, even to persons of intelligence, a vain and chimerical thing of no use and no value, both in appearance and in reality. So philosophy, the practice of philosophy, was already being rejected in his time. 
is he philosophia here? Is he like love of wisdom? Is he what's he talking about here? There's a a way you can do it that I think good and worthwhile, and a way that you can do it where it's uh, pretty much pointless. So for me, the philosopher is Socrates. It's not Aristotle. <laughs> Thomas says it's Aristotle, but it's Socrates who is ever joyful and ever talking about all the things that matter most. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he, Montaigne a little later makes fun of the people who want to know whether, you know, how many letters there are in a particular Greek verb in the future tense. Yeah. Quibbling about finer points of obscure things. This is not what philosophy is. Philosophy is wisdom. Philosophy is care of the soul. You know, Conan, what is best in life? That's philosophy. Hmm. Okay. Montaigne has an essay called That to Think as a Philosopher is to Learn to Die. Yeah, Socrates has that in the Phaedo. I have to read that one. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Does he contradict himself there? Does he say it's sad? No. Mm -mm. No, no, no. In fact, on. Uh... They're on page 211 where he talks about passing away. I can't quite find it. I see it in my notes, but I don't see the passage there exactly. Maybe I was tripping. So many names, so many victories and conquests buried in oblivion make it ridiculous to hope to perpetuate our names by the capture of ten insignificant troopers in an unimportant little fortress that is, denote, that is known only by its fall, the proud pomp of so many foreign nations, the swollen majesty of many courts and stately mansions steadies us and permits us our sight to endure the brilliancy of our own without blinking. So many millions of men interred before ourselves encourage us not to fear going to join such good company in the other world, and so with the rest. When you think about everybody dies, does it make it more of a horrible thing or less of a horrible thing or not even horrible? Uh, maybe not even horrible. I think there's a horrible manner of doing nursing homes, but once you're dead, it's not. <laughs> But back to this thing about philosophy, like he's worried about philosophy going away in his own time or people, people's, the waning popularity of doing philosophy in his own time. Well, here we are 400 years later nearly, and most philosophizing uh, now is probably done, or people think at least, that it's done sort of in the academic arenas, you know. And in the, ac hmm. in the world of academia, there is a bias for or originality. You know, if there's a highest best, Carl, and there's something that's true, originality isn't the standard. It's not the standard. It, it, you know, truth and correctness, cor whatever correctness is, you know, attaining the truth has to be the standard. And, you know, for coming up with something new to publish it just ends up encouraging people to just bebop and scat and, frankly, make shit up as far as I can tell. Genuine love of wisdom. It's probably not academic because and, what this means, I was joking a bit, you know, Conan, what is best in life? That's philosophy. Yes. His answer is funny, you know, to con conquer your enemies, see them driven before you, hear the lamentations of their women. All right. That's an answer, Conan. Let's talk about that. But he's doing it, right? He, how many articles do you read that start off with what is best in life? You know, and Socrates is always for for me. Socrates is a philosopher. Montaigne to me is a bit like him. He's always exhorting the people he talks to to live a good life. Men of Athens, I love you, but I will not cease exhorting you to seek virtue and to be the best. Aren't you ashamed to be from Athens and and still care so much about all this crap you care about? He doesn't say that. I'm paraphrasing. That's for me as philosophy. And I want people to not think of it as academic. And I also want people to not think about, not be concerned with originality. Earlier in this essay, Montaigne says that if you judge and decide and choose to agree with Plato or whoever, then those ideas become yours. I really don't think that philosophy, I'm making the air quotes here, is going to move forward much. Uh, well, who I, cares if it does? Right. I don't even care. Does the, wisdom move forward? No. 
I think the best and highest thoughts have probably been thought. We just need to rediscover those and find a way to make those best and highest thoughts and those truest things our own. And you do that by doing Carl Lindgian style philosophy around the campfire. People will read a dialogue of Plato, for example, and be frustrated and confused. And I, I say mission accomplished. Yeah. You know, that's the point. It's supposed to be frustrated and confused so that now you do the thinking. What happens is in each individual mind. Yeah. That's where love of wisdom happens. And that's where if there is any wisdom, that's where it's going to go. It's in each individual mind. Uh, which for me, this is the whole thing about this theory of education. that It can't be done through compulsion. You cannot compel somebody to love wisdom. No. You can invite them. You can show them. Say, look over there. Isn't that neat? Which is what I try to do with these books. Here's a line on 219, Carl. He says this is from Epicurus. Let not the youngest shun philosophy, nor the oldest weary of it. He who does otherwise seems to say either that it is not yet the time to live happily or that it is no longer the time. <laughs> so the connection between philosophy and happiness. Do you want to be happy? Well, you gotta, you got to do this. Do you want to be happy for the rest of your life? Do philosophy. <laughs> better, better make an uh, ugly woman your wife. Uh, he wants to keep <laughs> the school day short and uh, not confine the students. And he wants him to have lots of lots of stuff going on. Even games and bodily exercises will be part of his study. Running, wrestling, music, dancing, hunting, the management of horses, and the use of weapons. I would have his exterior agreeableness and social demeanor and his personal bearing shape themselves at the same time with his inner being. It is not a spirit. It is not a body that we are training. It is a man. We must not separate them. Mm -hmm. I love that bit. We have education stretch more and more and longer and longer. and maybe we don't. You know, what do you really need to teach people content-wise? You can't teach people to think. You awaken in them their own thinking. And once you've done that, the rest he owes to action. And now you know how to think. Now you're ready. Yeah, on the next page he says, I am of Plutarch's opinion that Aristotle did not so much occupy the time of his famous pupil, Alexander, in the skill of constructing syllogisms or in the principles of geometry, as in teaching him wise precepts concerning valor, prowess, nobleness of character, and temperance, and the courage to fear nothing. And with this preparation, he sent him forth, when still a child, to subjugate the empire of the world with only 30,000 foot soldiers, 4,000 horse, and 42,000 crowns. The other arts and branches of knowledge, he says, Alexander held in high esteem and praised their excellence. But as for himself taking pleasure in them, it was not easy to surprise him and the desire to practice them. Yeah, Alexander was educated in virtues. We think. There on 222, Carl, he pretty much says, uh, don't harden this student to punishment because that hardens him overall. But we should harden him to ease. He should be <laughs> hardened against ease. I like that a lot. And he says, we should sweeten the food that is healthy for the child and make bitter what is harmful to him. And I wrote next to that, and so with our laws. Perverse incentives. Yep. I was talking to a friend of mine, Justin, this weekend. And here in Oklahoma, we have casino gaming. And we have some legalized marijuana and no anti-usury laws. <laughs> All those things kind of toy with people's dopamine. I'm definitely a free will kind of guy, but you can, uh, you can mess with somebody's reward centers enough. They, they start to not act right. Right. If gambling addicts, drug addicts, sex addicts, people in credit card debt, a lot of them have addictive behavior and they buy things with their credit card, like dinner, when they know they don't have the money and they already have credit card debt that's going to take them years to pay off. I used to be very libertarian and my, my buddy is probably still pretty libertarian. And I said, you know, I think that we need, probably need to have laws that protect people um, from having their dopamine <laughs> hacked for commercial <laughs> anti-dopamine laws. Well, well, you know, 
I don't want to control people, and I don't want the state making a whole bunch of dictates about how people should behave. But if somebody has a commercial interest and a huge amount of capital behind that interest, and they can find a way to mess with your biochemistry to get you to give them money, they're going to do it. And if that's your smartphone that's designed carefully to keep your time on the phone at the maximum, if the slot machine has the right flashing lights and the right colors and the right stuff to get you to keep yanking that lever and putting coins in it, uh, whatever, those people are going to do that. And uh, a large number of our friends and families and community will fall prey to that. But that so is there a problem with Montaigne's view of non-compulsion in education then? I think it presumes a certain kind of family. Society is not made up of nothing but that one kind of household. Yeah. So we are recording this, dear listener, in the time of the great Corona plague quarantined 2020 journal so of a lot of us here. are sitting yeah a lot of us are sitting at home and a lot of, all the schools are canceled and so people are some people are attempting to educate their children at home which i think is a good thing and so my theory of education as i was telling some of these people that were homeschooling the first time I, and they were asked me and some lady from church asked me she's got a bunch of kids and she don't know what to do with them it's like keep the screens turned off and have good things in the house and eventually they'll learn stuff out of boredom yeah you know if you keep the negative and what i say are negative are these distracting things and all of the screens are designed to get you that dopamine hit the way that the likes come up Mm -hmm. They're doing experiments on you. And it, this is not tinfoil hat stuff. This is out there. This is like in the Huffington Post. This is not secret. They want you to be addicted to your phone. Yep. To have it be something you can't do without. And that's all going to distract you from thinking and learning and being yourself. Turn it all off and you're going to do fine. But, you know, having that non compulsory education, oh, it presumes that you're not going to have all that crap in your your house uh about turning the you say uh you know turn all that stuff off and have good things around and they'll do it eventually out of boredom i think i've said this on the show before my my dad says you star starve a dog and he'll eat turnip greens that's it get them to do what you want them to do but uh, if any of you guys are out there experimenting with your first forays into homeschooling because we're in a play gear my advice would be don't try to replicate school. Don't stand in front of the kids with a chalkboard and don't worry too much about worksheets or anything like that. Think about, you know, what can we learn right now? And, and think about education. Don't follow a school type template. Um, it's a specific thing that exists in a specific institution under specific conditions and you won't have that at home and, probably don't want it anyway so don't, it's okay don't try if that. you don't if you can cultivate montaigne talks about curiosity i don't think he uses that word but that everything is interesting take an interest in everything yeah yeah think if about what can be deep, learned right now yeah everything is interesting uh in the moments when we do turn on the screen sometimes in the evening we have been watching a little bit of dirty jobs the micro show it's available on youtube you talked about that that show about all the Irish craftsmen. Yeah, hands. So good. But Dirty Jobs is fascinating. You know, yeah. learning about how they inseminate the turkeys <laughs> and who has to do that. Because <laughs> they're so giant and weird now, they can't even, their, their junk won't touch. <laughs> it's fascinating. Is that what's Everything. happened in the United States? Is that where our birth rates are falling? Everybody's so big, their junk won't touch. <laughs> Like turkeys. <laughs> is that what it is? Oh, I think there's a lot going on. That's another topic. But uh, everything's interesting. It, you know, don't be afraid to go off on a tangent. If your kid wants to study dinosaurs and only dinosaurs for a while, it's all right. You can learn a lot from dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. You know, Kingdom Phylum, Class Order, Family Genus Species. You can get it from dinosaurs. Whatever. Yeah, or maybe they want to build something. I think we, we tend to, kids that want to build stuff tend to get squished 
in institutional school because there's no time. Yeah. So we're going to build something today. Get some wood, get some nails. You'll learn a lot doing that. And there'll be points where you can talk about other topics in connection with that. Everything's connected. Yeah, he, he talks about, I can't remember where it is. It's very early in the, oh, here it is on page 201. He says, uh, uh, let me see, what he shall learn, make him look at it in a hundred aspects and apply it to as many different subjects as possible to see if he has fully apprehended it and made it his own. Yeah, so whatever you learn, apply it to everything. And so, also, anything you learn is applicable to everything in some way or another. Yeah, I mean, if there's a universe, that uni means something, right? Oh, but what about alternate universes? And what about the multiverse? And what about... Uh, about uh, ugh, yeah. Rubbish. We're going to talk about infinity one day on this show, and I'm gonna my head's going to just split open. I'm going to die. <laughs> Do you believe in calculus? No. It's witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to add up an infinite number of in infinitesimals and get a non-infinite answer. Yeah. We need to do a show. We need uh, Descartes, maybe Leibniz, something. We'll do a show about where we can do so on infinity. It'd be great. He has a little Diogenes. You know, my, my, my youngest daughter, Diogenes is her favorite. Mm. And uh, he has a little Diogenes story in here. I hadn't ever heard before. He said, uh, someone reproved Diog Diogenes because, being ignorant, he dealt with philosophy. He, he says, I deal with it all the more fitly. Hegesius begged him to read some book uh, to him. He says, you're a queer, he replied. You select real natural things, not painted ones. Why do you not select also natural and real things for the enrichment of the mind? Act, act, well, act. Okay. Well, we're going to read stuff, though. Yeah, but the point of the reading is it's what happens in your mind. That's the point of it. The point is not that you come out being able to repeat everything Aristotle said. That's a party trick. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a memorization trick. The point is that you thought mm -hmm. you'll be better for having done it. It's like if you could have all the best friends and smart friends that you could sit around a campfire and have these great discussions, that would be great. But you probably don't. But fortunately for you, a lot of them wrote books. And so you can invite Aristotle to your campfire, but make sure you read him intellectually. In other words, you're not just going to copy out what he says. You're going to say, why does he say this? What's the connection? Is he right? Does it matter? These sorts of questions. You know, you make it your own. And this is why seminars are so important. You might read the book, but you go to the seminar, and then that's where you can start to make it your own. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would hope Montaigne would approve of what we're doing, or at least not hate it. You know, that that's the point. The point is not to have, it's not a reading list. It's not a book club. Right. It's more like fight club, <laughs> except we do talk about it. Okay, here's his contradiction, Carl. He says, uh, as Cleanthes said, just as the voice, when confined with the narrow channel of a trumpet, comes forth more penetratingly and more strongly, so it seems to me that the thought, being compressed within the various forms of verse, darts forth more briskly and strikes me with a livelier impact. And then back here on page 228, he pretty much says that, uh, I like the words in the poetry, but uh, I don't care much for the rhyme and meter part. Right. So which is it? Yay for poetry or nay? Montaigne is right on both accounts. That's why we like Walt Whitman. Hmm. Okay. I know that trying to uh, conform your words into one of the classic forms of poetry. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good exercise. You have to be careful with what you say in order to say it. He says, uh, whether it come before or after a profitable phase, phase, yeah, a fine stroke of wit is always in season. If it does not fit what goes before, what comes after, it is good in itself. I am not one of those who think that a good rhythm makes a good poem. Let him make a short syllable long, if he will. About that it matters not. If the conceptions are pleasing, if the mind and the judgment have played their parts well, there's a good poet, I will say, but a bad versifier. Well, that would be Walt Whitman. That's right. <laughs> bad a good versifier. poet and a bad versifier. I think that's right. 
Yeah, he has quite a bit to say about reading there early in the essay. Here in the late mid, uh, he has a little bit about writing where he talks about you know, how he wants to twist the thread of his own thought and that he has to go in search of that thread when he writes. And he says, the way of speaking that I like is a simple and natural speech, the same on paper as on the lips, a style pithy, sinewy, brief and concise, not so refined and smooth as vehement and quick. The word is wise that strikes a blow. Mm -hmm. I try to write the way I speak. And that will not get you good grades in freshman comp. But I think when people read something I wrote, it sounds like I'm there with them. That might not be the right way to do it, but I don't much care. Uh, but I think he's, I think he likes the same thing. He says, I will willingly, Im I have willingly imitated this disorderliness in his manner of talking and writing and stuff. Yeah. Language is supposed to serve a purpose. Um, he's got, in mine, it says something like, uh, he knows no ablative, subjunctive, substantive, or grammar, neither does a servant or a fishwife on the petit point, yet they will give you your fill of talk if you'll listen and will very likely make no more mistakes in the linguistic rules and the best master of arts in France. He knows no rhetoric nor how by way of preface to capture the benevolence of the candid reader, nor has he any wish to do so. In fact, all such fine tricks are easily eclipsed by the light of a simple, artless truth. The tricks of rhetoric, you know, where you, you come in and you, you explain who you are and, and you have your, your preamble. And he seems to not be a fan of that. Yep. That that's artifice. Should have Malachi talk about Montaigne. Because <laughs> there's, there's artifice in, in, in rhetoric and advertising. But you, sh you should know it's artifice. He keeps talking about strength and sinew and brawn those kinds of words when he talks about his writing and he talks about good writing, he wants the argument to carry. He wants the, the strength of thought behind it. He's, he doesn't want the flower. He doesn't want to win somebody with the flowery speech or tug it on their heartstrings or any other rhetorical tricks. He doesn't like that because strength and sinews cannot be borrowed, but the attire and the cloak may be. Translate. The sophist can speak about anything and can, and you know, maybe carry the day with a lot of people, but there's nothing there. They've borrowed the attire and the cloak. But you can also carry the argument with strength and sinew, which is to know the thing, to actually have that subject matter. Oh, I wish we could. Well, I'm not I'm, so sure we can. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Aristotle in his rhetoric says that most people cannot be convinced by a dialectic truth. They have to. You have to use rhetoric to convince large numbers of people. I think that's true. I, I agree with Aristotle there. This might be like one of the core problems in Western culture is the use of rhetoric, the appropriateness of it, its fight with truth. Right. I kind of hate it. I and know. I use it. I was talking to our friend Andrew with the engineering background, Carl. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, we were talking about the coronavirus thing. He's like, well, I don't know why they don't just come clean and give everybody all the numbers and just explain what's going on. I was like, Andrew, it doesn't work. Like the facts don't matter to most people. You have to use, you have to use rhetoric. <sighs> and, but he's my he, heavy sigh. And my he says, sigh but, is meaningful. he says, but, but, but my truth. I'm like, I know you're an engineer. I get it. It doesn't work. Yeah, well, if your goal is to get people, well, okay, let me go back to Dune, and I don't mean this in a mean way. People are the way they are, and most people are not quite fully human. Yeah, I'm theologically committed that everybody who's human is fully human, okay? So I'm not making classifications for terms of ethics, you know, like we can disregard some people, but most people are not. They have not fully embraced thinkers. their humanity. Right. Right. We would like there to be more of them. I would like there to be more of them, frankly, because you're more interesting. <laughs> if if uh, you have thoughts, I love to hear them. Well, that's uh, very generous of you. I would say that I want them to do that because they're less dangerous. Oh, but they might be more dangerous. <sighs> if they have thoughts. Well... Not the humanity part, anyway. I like interesting people. Yeah, I do too, mostly. I think we're to the part where we should talk about his education. Montaigne. Yeah, they only spoke Latin to him until he was he was six. No one was allowed to speak anything but Latin in his presence until he was six 
years old. His parents did not have good Latin, by the way. <laughs> That's a little odd. It's less odd for him than it would be for us because all learned discourse was done in Latin. Uh, your legal documents would have been in Latin. Latin was a living language at that point. It just wasn't the language of the people. Yep. Yeah, he'd go to church and they'd have Latin mass and he'd correct the pronunciation. <laughs> but I mean, he Newton, knew it all. Look, I've got Newton's Principia up on my shelf here. It's a translation because Newton wrote in Latin. Right. Leibniz wrote in Latin. In, uh, and these are after Montaigne. Latin's a living language. So it's not quite so weird, but it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to not be able to have your parents express themselves to you very well because they because because you don't speak their language and you live in the house with them so odd <laughs> i like that he was done with school at age 13 yeah this is I, I wondered if this was true he says my latin was corrupted forthwith and since then by unaccustomedness i have entirely lost the use of it and my unusual education was of no service to me, except that it enabled me at the beginning to skip over the lower classes. For when I left the college at 13, I had finished my course, as they now call it. And in truth, without any benefit that I can now put my hand on, says the guy that writes one of the finest books ever written and has some yeah, of the most complex no and thoughts, every, you know, whatever. I imagine that all of this testing probably happened in his house when he was a kid. I bet his dad, if his dad's the sort that's going to hire people to talk Latin to him, his dad's an interesting person. Sounds like it. His father had yeah. heard that to startle a child upon waking would disturb their minds and cause them psychic damage. The father caused me to be wakened by the sound of some instrument, and he was never without a man who performed that service for me. <laughs> so somebody would wake him with a, playing the harp or the piano or... Uh, gently uh, rouse him from his sleep every morning so as to not uh, disturb his mind. Because, you know, young people, when they're growing and their minds are forming, if you rattle their brain, they might come unwound. <laughs> I mean, I mean, how fabulously wealthy must these people have been? You yeah. know, can you imagine? Can you imagine putting somebody on staff to play a little ditty on the violin to wake up uh, your youngest every morning? <laughs> he talks about his favorite books here. He likes his Virgil. He likes, he loves Plutarch, loves Plutarch. He says he doesn't like, he doesn't know anything about so many things. And he quotes from Aristotle and, uh, and Plato over and over in, in this thing. And he said that his parents felt that the danger was not that I should go wrong, but that I should do nothing. No one prophesied that I should become a bad man, but merely a useless one. They saw a distaste of work, but not ill deeds in him. <laughs> There you go. He wrote this long, long letter, a thoughtful, interesting thing about educating young people. Uh, a little glimpse into his household there for this friend of his who was pregnant with her first child. I think, yeah. well, how, how, how awesome and delightful is yeah. that? I don't think you should let anybody read this because they'll become dissatisfied with the current state of education. Yeah, don't let your kid read it. He'll wonder why the guy isn't waking him with a, with a flute uh, <laughs> recitation every morning. Or he'll wake up and say, salve mater. <laughs> Start speaking Latin and only Latin. Uh, yeah, Montaigne's not quite a normal person, but he's a very interesting person. And I'm going to dip into this quite a bit, I think. I'm very excited to get the hard copies. You can find him at used books. For, I, I paid $25 for the three-volume set. Yeah, it's beautiful. Nothing. It's so nothing. Most of, these, uh, most of these little essays are under 20 pages. And they're fun and beautifully written and have very interesting stories and thoughts in them. I, I highly recommend uh, Montaigne. This is the second time we've delved into Montaigne. I did a, we did a show on cannibals. Uh, I did that with Miles, I don't know, a year ago. Miles Marco mm -hmm. Bennett, you can go listen to that thing if you're interested. And I wanted to read a thank you letter that I got from someone who joined our little mailing list. So if you go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast, and join our little VIP list. We send you some goodies. And a guy, Josh, wrote this to me. He says, I just wanted to write you a quick note of thanks, both for the Reading Digest, Reading List Digest, and the How to Read a Book Summary, and for the good work you and everyone else at Online Great Books are doing. I've been a listener since day one of both the Online Great Books podcast and Barbell Logic, and I really can't thank you enough for the immense positive impact you've had on my life and outlook. That's pretty crazy. But then he says, you've inspired me 
not to live a life of quiet desperation, and I'm now running a fledgling tutorial business where I try to help kids that are stuck in the UK's own minimum security penitentiary system, which is what I call schools. He says, I'm also training as a lawyer, but the things I've encountered through OGB are proving more valuable in many respects than four years at Oxford and a year in law school did. My very best wishes to you and your family, and I hope you're all staying safe from the Kung flu, he says. (laughs) Four years at where? Oxford. I heard of that place. Yeah, uh, that is high praise. Josh, thank you for sending that. Guys, Josh might be crazy. But he might not be, too. So just go join the damn email list, would you? Because it's time to get back to basics. If you go to the email list, you join that. Uh, pretty soon, we'll send you a digest of our reading list. You can read on your own. We'll send you a summary of how to read a book and a few other things. And maybe you could use that to start doing this yourself. Look, working from home, we're all shut-ins now in our play gear. So let's get back to basics and uh, read some of these books. You can't sit on the couch and get saddle sores in your ass watching Netflix for the rest of your days. Let's, let's do this, huh? Right. Hey, what if we read The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe? I think that might be a good one here. Uh, since well, sure. We're and then I had a thought the the for perhaps subsequently. Mm, lay it on me. That this is a book that I have actually never read. Uh-oh. A shocking gap in my education, which is George Orwell, 1984. I have a chance to read that for the first time. I've never read it. So that Yeah, we need to do that. We need to do that. I haven't read that in quite some time. I've probably read it three or four times. Have you read Animal Farm? I might not be in a correct mental place to read 1984. Well, we could punt on it for a while. I might need to be put on a 24-hour watch. Take my shoelaces from me if I read that. Well, there's another online Great Books podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, we don't charge anything for this thing, so send it to a friend. Those are our wages. Recommendations. Send that. And then also... Uh, go to iTunes and look up the Music and Ideas podcast. And you can go look up the one on West End Blues. We'll have a listen to that or the one on proms. We've got a show coming up about Chopin very soon. Send that to a friend if you like that show as well. And we will talk to you next week. Next week.